Welcome to the FMCG Guys podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Torres, live from Barcelona. If this is the first time you tune into this podcast, we speak with the top voices in the consumer goods, FMCG, and retail industries. And we're now over 170 episodes in. So do go into our website or your favorite podcast platform to entertain yourself and hopefully be educated with some of the industries top voices and remember we are part of a family of podcasts which is headed by the cpg guys in the us so if you're interested in what's happening in the omni cpg which is fmcg in the us world tune into their podcast i think i don't know i've lost the number the count of how many episodes they've done but they've been running since 2020 so they have a lot of content and if you haven't yet, remember to follow us on LinkedIn, where you'll be joining a community of 15,000 members <coughs> and counting. And you can also now find us on Instagram, which in which we're developing similar but a bit different type of content. It's a good way of also keeping up to date with our newest episodes, which, by the way, come out every Wednesday and Saturday morning. And yes, I'm not alone here. So please welcome on one side my co-host, Christina Nicolau. Hi, Christina. How are you? Hi, Daniel. Doing very well. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you virtually after seeing you twice in person this year. The latest of the times was at Shop Talk in Barcelona. So good to, to see you through Zoom, which is a more, more natural habitat. Or was it yes. better in person? Uh, I really enjoyed meeting you in person, especially since uh, our event at Barcelona was a very successful one. It was, it was. So we had a pre-shop talk event in which we had like around 90 or 100 people coming from a lot of brands. So it was a lot of fun. And as an extrovert, I was kind of euphoric as well. <laughs> uh, and after that, by the way, I was in Cannes for a week in which, yeah, I learned very intense event, a lot of networking, a lot of parties as well, I have to say. So always hard to keep a balance of that. But I'm going to be back in Cannes next year for sure. A lot of interesting people. And I was also at Detail in London last week. So I was just telling you, Christina, how happy I am to be in my back in Barcelona to my boring routine of just like eating healthy food that I cook and going to the gym every now and then. And with some much better temperatures, I bet. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the temperature is decent as well. So happy about that as well. So... Who do we have on the other side of the table? Very excited about our guest today, the general manager for the UK at Glambia, Jessica Watson. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi, Daniel. I'm very well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here with both you and Christina today. Connecting from a summer North Pole, aka United Kingdom. That's it. It's very classically British outside today. A little bit grey, intermittent rain, and I'm here with a jumper on. But um, that only makes the sunny days more delightful and exciting. That's true. That's true. It's <laughs> half glass, uh, glass half full um, philosophy. I, I actually googled the weather. We're we're at the beginning of July, and it's 17 degrees in the UK, which is the kind of temperature we get in a nice day in in December in Barcelona. Yeah, that's it. Um, but, you know, when it hits 25 and the sun comes out and everyone is sat in the streets drinking, enjoying the weather, uh, there's probably nowhere better to be. And in fact, just outside the office, they've set up a deck chair stand with a screen playing Wimbledon. And if a little bit of sun hits that, I think it'll be a really brilliant uh, moment for both the team and also everyone walking past. So fingers crossed that this is only a one day thing. Yeah, fingers crossed to you. Hopefully when this episode comes out in maybe a week or two, the, the situation will have seen a, a, a turnaround in the weather situation. Speaking of turnarounds, Jessica, can you give us a bit of your background of how you started your career? I know that you you are, as Christina, a PNG alumni, aka Proctoid, how did how did you how did you fall into FMCG? Yeah, it's a um, it's a great question. I when I went to university, I didn't have a um, career in mind. Um, I think there was a lot of perspective from my family around kind of career, more classical careers, law, accounting. My brother's a doctor. This was you know very well understood and supported. Um, and there was a bit of kind of questions to me on what are you going to do? My degree was human sciences, so it was everything uh, science related to people, so behavior, 
uh, urbanization and kind of themes which did relate a little bit to consumerism. Um, but I still didn't really know where I was going to take it. And so I went to a careers fair. And when I met the team at P&G who were at that careers fair, and they spoke about the brands, which I'd heard of, they spoke about the business that they ran and, and the types of roles that they had, um, I thought it sounded really interesting. And I thought they seemed like really great people. Um, so I applied for the internship and managed to successfully get an internship in the summer of my second year of university, which was a really big uh, coup, both in terms of having a plan for the summer and also being able to kind of really hold back the gate, the floodgates of people who were asking me what I was going to do with my life. I was like, oh, I'm doing this internship. Um, I really enjoyed it far more than I had ever expected work to be fun. I, I didn't particularly associate work with fun, um, but really enjoyed the internship and was lucky enough to be offered a position to start in London um, after that internship with a kind of eight month, you can go traveling, you finish, up, you finish uni in July, you can travel till March, we'll take you in in the March intake. So that ticked a lot of boxes for me. And um, you couldn't refuse really like to finish well, sort of, yeah. all travel without being worried about having a job, right? Like, yeah. That's it. And just kind of don't like completely stuff up your third year of uni um, and make sure you pass, get your degree. But it, it did take a lot of pressure off. Um, but also I was kind of excited to go off to do something quite fun. Um, and so that that was it. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about should I be doing something else? Um, I kind of happily joined P&G and had a really brilliant start to my career there. And I have a kind of a similar story, Jessica. I, you know, I am an architectural engineer. So coming from an engineer school, I went into PNC, which was like a completely different world. And I was very uh, anxious, like, what do I do now? Should I get like an MBA? And everyone would, was telling me like, no, you're good. Like you're in PNC, you're going to learn everything you need to learn here. And indeed, like for me, it was like a huge school. And I was wondering how was the, that experience for you? And what would be like your key learnings in this big school of PNC? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there's, there's so many, and I could probably deliver you about six different acronyms, and you'd know what they all mean. <laughs> the the various different frameworks. MSMP. Yeah, MSMP, the PSF. Um, you know, on we could go. I think what PNG does so brilliantly is um, share really powerful formulas and frameworks into which to structure your thinking. Um, they do it in a way that I don't think. Um, hampers creativity, but they enable you to bring your ideas to life in a really um, articulate and organized manner. Um, and so it was the ability to kind of consistently move forward, turn insight into action. Um, and a couple of these key themes just really resonated with me personally. Um, I remember a training session on the difference between data and insight. Um, I remember the kind of structure, the way they structured their, their selling was really, really powerful. Um, I remember a framework they had over who was the owner versus the approver versus the contributor. I think Christina will know exactly which acronym I'm referring to. And, and these things all kind of were very logical, but it's not immediately obvious if you're not taught them. Um, PNG also give you a lot of trust in your own capability. They're very um, passionate about, we will teach you what you need to know, assuming you have the right kind of um, inherent attitudes and capabilities and, and personal kind of approach to make it work. And I found that trust came through very quickly. The fact I had a business that was mine from day one and I was kind of left to get on with it um, was quite powerful. And I didn't really realize the weight of responsibility at the time, which is probably a good thing. But looking back, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, and in that kind of early years, they do enable you to be very supported and to um, stretch yourself and kind of put some of your um, gut, gut approaches into action with these kind of really uh, helpful frameworks. And I think for me, it was the ability to kind of consistently apply um, like real credible acumen against kind of personal hypotheses that I found really helpful. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a lot about culture fit. And I think that's something that PNG does very well is really like clearly hire all these graduates, which for ABC reasons fit with their way of working and culture and just roll them up. Like, obvious, it's a, they have like a mythical, I don't know if that's the word, but a very well known higher from within philosophy, right? In which, mm -hmm. yeah, 99% of PNGers are hired from within at all levels. So it's it's a very interesting model. Something and that it's, is- it's quite, 
Yeah. It is quite incredible because they, they do do it really consistently across geographies. So mm. I spent four years in the UK and some of my greatest friends are from that period of my life. I then moved to Australia. Yeah. And yeah, again, yeah. the connection with the PNGers I had there, they were, an, again, it was like a very natural connection. I had people in my team there who were from India, very different background. But again, there was like actually a very deep friendship that could be established. And I think that's amazing. I don't quite know what it is that enables them to do it, but um, it's, a re it's something that I felt very fortunate to be a part of. Well, I think that first of all, they, don't, they only hire very smart people, right? So that when you're working with other smart people, I think that you have a base. And I, and I guess that there's like the fact of like building every business unit very well and with a consistent approach, I think helped. But um, what, it, what is unusual from your experience, Jessica, is that the classic thing in, in Europe in terms of like PNG internal promotions is that if you're high potential, you're sent to Geneva, which is the European headquarter. Now your plane went a bit further because you moved to <laughs> Sydney, Australia. Uh, yeah. What happened there? Yeah, um, so my, my mom is an Australian and I carry both passports, oh. uh, British and Australian. Similar to me, you know, my mom's Kiwi, right? I met, yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we spent a lot of my childhood traveling to Australia and I kind of looked at my future and thought, well, why would you live in London if you could live in Sydney? Um, I really loved the idea that you could have a job like this kind of quite urban-based job that PNG represented that I really enjoyed. You could do that in the same city that you could surf in the morning in and go to the theatre in the evening in. And I just thought that like that was the best it could get. Um, and I really wanted to be a part of it. And I, I pretty much from day one kind of asked PNG whether they would support this. And they were very, um, I think they were quite bemused to begin with until they figured out that I was deadly serious about taking myself to Sydney. Um, and that I was, I was kind of, I was hell bent on it. Like I knew that with four years of PNG, I could probably, and an Australian passport, I would be quite employable in Sydney. Um, and so I kind of said, look, I, I really want to go and I need your support. And if, if you don't give it, I do really understand because uh, one of their philosophies is the needs of the individual and the needs of the company are inseparable. And if this doesn't work for you, then I do understand. But I think at that point in time, they were really supportive of my career. Um, and it turned out to be a brilliant move. I learned so much in the transition across to Australia. I'd like to think I contributed a lot to that business and to PNG overall. Um, and we had kind of another PNG and I had another kind of eight successful years together. So I hope they still see it as the right decision. Um, and for me personally, it was an absolute game changer for my life. And you said you learned so much, and I guess like it's a very big difference when it comes to moving from one side of the world to the other, like literally. So do you have any anecdotes to share or key learnings that you had from your transitions from a business point of view or a personal one? If, if, I, can, if I can add one anecdote is that she must have done, you must have done pretty well in Australia, Jessica, because then you were moved to the Geneva of Asia, which is where PNG have their Asia headquarters, but also a city that I think is probably as peaceful and to, according to some boring as Geneva, which is Singapore, right? Which is, is a good sign that things went well for you there as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. I had a successful time in Australia and, and in Singapore and I thought Singapore was going to be very boring and it's about to be unbelievable, but that's probably a story for another time. Um, I think what was really interesting professionally about Australia was the um, the retail landscape there. So my my kind of acumen in PNG was sales, um, and in the UK you have these huge powerful retailers: Tesco, Asda, Morrison, Sainsbury's, Boots, Superdrug, and there's a lot of them, and they all really matter. Um, but you're kind of working out how you play across multiple different um, retailers, and that's that's one challenge. In Australia, you have a different challenge because just shy of 80% of your business goes through two retailers, Woolworths and Coles. And so the power dynamic is quite different and the stakes are much higher in terms of um, if you make a loss in one of those accounts, like it, it really does swing the year. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that um, when I think about some of the legacy or the, or the behemoth categories for P&G, you've got laundry, you've got baby, um, and these are, these are kind of household names. Like I grew up using Ariel. Pampers was like, you know, I remember the boxes of Pampers storing my clothes when I was a child. Like it's really, really deep in British culture. And these brands just weren't in Australia at all. 
Um, and so you kind of you didn't have that side of the PNG machine there. It gave you less scale with the business, and it meant again that you were much more concentrated in the categories you had to play with to deliver your business. Um, and then you also had a different dynamic, which is Australia operates much more like a European or maybe an American business, but it's actually run through the Singapore structure in PNG. Um, and in that seeing a poor structure, the leaders there are kind of looking at how they get their growth out of total ASPAC, um, where you have extremely exciting and interesting markets with huge penetration opportunity, like Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, um, where you've got an ability to be very agile, uh, to innovate quite quickly. Australia operates even, I would say, more stringently than the UK with very long lead times, very, very high stakes um, new line listing processes, category reviews. So whilst it's kind of it's kind of hard to imagine, like you, the way you had to play in Australia to win was so so finessed. You had to be so pointy, um, and, and that was really interesting professionally. Mm. Um, the Australian retailers also have unbelievable shopper data, which also means that your kind of selling acumen was was really stretching. So I kind of took what I saw the best in the UK doing and was able to apply it into Australia. Um, and I found that really interesting professionally um, with actually a really great team around that kind of built up over the time I was there and, and we just kind of got better and better. Uh, so it was exciting to be part of that journey. And then personally, I think um, it's never to be underestimated what, what's involved in moving country. Um, and it's kind of, it shapes, you know, some of my philosophies on life in general, which is around just embrace the phase. There's so many pros and cons to everything. Um, Sydney, those pros I mentioned at the beginning, so if in the morning theatre at night, do your job in the day, that's a major pro. There's obviously a major con of, like, you don't see your family very much. And so I think that has kind of then really helped me understand about just trying to be quite present, having a vision for your life, but really enjoying what you've got in the moment because now I'm back in London. I mean, I, I don't surf in the morning. And I, I could go to theatre, but let's be honest, I'm really not doing that at night. So... You know, it's a different phase of life. I have a child now. So it's all around, like, how do you then personally really make the most of the opportunity you've got um, and embrace the benefits of, of the situation? Because there's always good and bad in everything. A bit like the British summer, but um, on a bigger scale. Exactly, exactly. And, and yeah, you're right. Like, Singapore could be a whole other episode of, like, living in Singapore. So so maybe a future part two, we can cover that. But um, yeah. But what made you so? You, obviously, you had a very successful run at at PNG. Um, worked in three different markets, so nothing to say there. So, what what attracted you about Glambia, your current role? Why did you decide to leave? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, I was in Singapore having a, a great time out there, really happy with PNG and kind of looking at the future opportunities. Um, but I had a unique kind of personal situation where I didn't yet have a family. I'd saved up uh, some money. Um, my husband and I were yet to get married. And it was kind of this unique moment in time in our lives where we could really step back and have a think about what do we want the next phase of our life to look like. Um, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to continue my entire career in the same company um, and progress in that organisation with the goals of... Um, you know, driving the categories that P&G played in, I kind of thought it would be really welcome for me personally just to have a bit of a change. And it was kind of a real unique moment in time. It turned out to be different to expected because it was just before 2020, but it was like, okay, we can go traveling across this time period. We're due to get married. Let's step back and, and take some time out. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is run my own business. Um, and actually, I have this kind of entrepreneurial lilt to my background, and I wanted to indulge that and really see whether I could make, make a run of it. Um, so I parted with PNG on good terms. It was important to have a clean break. I did an um, EMBA with the Content School of Business and Technology, so I could do that remotely. And the aim of that was to kind of broaden my um, professional acumen and also meet a new network. Um, whilst also spending a bit of time thinking about what are other models um, and other business opportunities that I can maybe spend some time on. And it was really interesting because obviously COVID hit. Uh, we ended up living in the countryside in the UK, which was amazing with my parents. Um, and it, it wasn't quite plan A, but it did really mean that there was a lot of time to spend thinking about, okay, different. we weren't distracted whilst you know traveling and just having a great time. It's a lot of time to, to spend on it. 
Um, and during that time, I wrote a training program, um, which is available online. But I, what I really learned during that time is that um, I like being in an office. I like being with a team. I like having a level of structure that is um, known amongst the group of people that you're operating within. Um, and I, I like the retail landscape and consumer goods. So actually, that kind of taught me that. So when the opportunity to work at um, Glamour Performance Nutrition came up at the end of that year um, in a sales director position back in my home market, um, I could kind of recognize the difference versus the Australian market. Um, it was an opportunity that I was just really excited to get behind. Glamby is a business in, uh, and particularly in the performance nutrition uh, side of the business, in a very different stage to P&G. Um, and that was something that I found really exciting. And rather than thinking of myself as someone who might want to do my own startup, I felt that I could add a lot of value in a scale up. Um, and that's kind of the journey that I've been on uh, with GPN over the last four years. But do tell us a little bit more about Glambia and kind of like what is the status right now of the business, how it has evolved and what's actually uh, the key things that our listeners should know about it. Yeah. Um, so how, where to start? Glam, Glambia is a, um, it's a PLC. So this is quite important. I think mm -hmm. this does change the dynamic in the business. So you've got this kind of amazing uh, PLC style culture. Um, there's two parts of the business. There's a B2B um, ingredients business, Glambia Nutritionals, and then there's a Glambia Performance Nutrition uh, part of the business. Um, and the way I always think about it is that uh, the nutrition side of the business was selling so much whey to Optimum Nutrition, the protein powder brand, that they saw the opportunity to acquire that brand. And that kind of formed, uh, I don't know if this is completely true, but this is my version of the truth. Um, that formed Glambia Performance Nutrition and led to kind of Uh, the stack of brands that we have in that space today, um, of which in the UK, you've got Optimum Nutrition um, Protein and Sports Nutrition, and you've got SlimFast, which is a weight management brand, um, along with uh, Nutrimino, which is a Danish um, lifestyle protein brand, um, and BSN, which is a um, protein powder brand as well. BSN and Nutrimino are much smaller. So it's really an Optimum Nutrition and SlimFast business. Um, for a performance nutrition side of the business. So that acquisition was uh, 15 years ago. So in terms of being a consumer goods brand building company, um, that's relatively new, at least in the P&G scale um, yeah. for, for Glambia Performance Nutrition. And if I look at the distribution um, of our brands, uh, particularly the, the optimum nutrition side of the business, Um, since I joined at the end of 2020 to where we are today, um, there's been, a, again, it's a just word, not a dictionary word, but there's been a mainstreamification of this category um, in sports nutrition um, as consumers are realizing that they need more protein in their diet um, and they're realizing that these kind of supplements are not just for elite athletes. Um, and that kind of growth in the category is really, really interesting and really exciting. Um, and actually, Optimum Nutrition is kind of uniquely poised to unlock some of that growth as an omni-channel player and an omni-format player. Um, actually, the competition set is um, neither omni-channel um, nor omni-format. So where they are more omni-channel, they're not omni-format. So it's a really kind of unique position for us as a brand in the market. Um, and the penetration of this category Um, is still relatively low uh, if you compare it to things I would have worked on before, like shampoo or toothpaste or moisturizer. Um, and for me, that's a really exciting change in mindset because um, the opportunity to trade consumers in is still huge um, into the total category. Um, and that means that the way you can partner with retailers is, is different um, and the way you can grow the total pie Um, from a consumer perspective is a bit different to categories that are more penetrated. I just want to ask you a little bit because this is hugely interesting. Uh, I'm very keen to understand a little bit more about your route to market because it has to be quite different versus what you have with PNC. I mean, leaving the B2B part aside, uh, do you now work with something very different in terms of like gyms or other points of sale which are closer to the consumer can drive uh, penetration even and recruitment even faster than a retailer channel perhaps? 
Yeah, yes, exactly. And we would play in all the conventional retail channels. So we have a, a huge business in the gyms. Mm -hmm. um, we're listed in uh, Fitness First, Pure Gym, David Lloyd, um, Anytime Gym, the Gym Group. Like we have a really established position in the gym channel. Um, and we would refer to that as the point of sweat. Um, it's a sales vehicle. It's also a, a marketing vehicle for us. Um, and from a format perspective, you're really trying to catch the consumer um, before or after they do their workout. So they'd be drinking a bar or a shake or a pre-workout shot um, versus, uh, an, uh, you know, a different part of the business and Amazon or Holland and Barrett, which would be much more powders focused, um, a bit more specialist, both protein powders, but also uh, gainer products, creatines, BCAAs, pre-workouts. Um, but you would have a big hole in the Barrett business, you'd have a big Amazon business, you've got brilliant distribution now across the grocery uh, portion of the UK, we're in Boots, we're in Superdrug, um, and we partner with the discounters as well. So we really are kind of full omni-channel, there's then a speciality online portion of the business, a whole speciality mm -hmm. channel, and a D2C. So from a kind of, um, yeah, commercial thinking perspective, balancing this all and making sure that you have your range your prioritization, your PPA, um, and your pricing strategy kind of workable across this landscape. Um, it's not simple. Yeah, absolutely. But it's interesting how how omni this category is when you stop mm. and learn about it because you have like the more impulse after doing sport, point of sweat occasions <laughs> is very different than buying like that creatine that you mentioned, which is something that you kind of plan into your whole routine. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and we're seeing as well that traditionally the um, the motivation was to build muscle mass. And that, that we're talking mainly optimum nutrition now. Um, that was the kind of typical consumer motivation. But now we're seeing a huge expansion to maximize athletic performance, pursue healthy outlook. And actually with that, you're getting um, consumers of, of both genders, of all ages, of, of different motivations. Uh, really coming in and entering the category. And again, that presents a huge opportunity um, from, a, from a brand and also a corporate perspective. Yeah, while also making a, a positive impact because, you know, it, it is a, a great model for people's health to be better, you know, that yeah. physical activity. And yeah. what about from a leadership perspective? So obviously, you, I think you led teams at PNG. I don't yeah. know how, how early you started leading teams there, but leading teams at PNG and now leading teams in a very, very different environment. How, yeah. tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the Glambia uh, mission is to help consumers achieve their performance and healthy lifestyle goals. Um, and I love that because that's sort of my, part of my mission as well. So I'm really uh, passionate about performance um, and high performing teams and making sure that people are enabled to perform at their peak and get the most out of their strengths. Um, we have a kind of strengths-based mindset at GPN UK, um, and we really, I'm really, uh, I really believe that when people are operating at things they're good at, they will just, you will just get more capacity and more flow and more enjoyment out of the team. And then healthy lifestyle um, is also so important to me. Lifestyle has always been really important to me. Um, and I think there's different stages in your career where you really learn to manage your capacity. I think that's something that you have to learn to be a leader. The amount of work never gets less. In fact, if anything, it only gets more. Um, but managing your capacity and finding your personal systems for that, um, I think is something that you learn on your way to, um, to leading bigger teams. And healthy lifestyle for me really encapsulates that because it's around um, a healthy mindset, it's around performing at your peak, it's around being physically healthy, it's around being motivated, being energetic. Um, and actually to have that as a corporate mission and our consumer mission um, is something that resonates really well for me as a leader. And then we try and embed that very tightly into the programs we've put in place for our teams in GPN UK um, so that people can have, I kind of oversimplified, but have a great life and you know, work is such a key part of your life um, that it's more about thriving at work than just surviving through work um, and how we help kind of, you know, continually improve on our employee experience um, and our kind of 
approach to, to kind of get after that, whilst also being highly performance focused. Like, I mean, you can see from my background, performance matters to me. Um, I've got a huge bias for action and I, I'm passionate, I'm very competitive. And so this, this kind of drive for performance is really important. And I think it's not a either or, it's an and. Um, and, and walking that line is kind of how I try and approach my leadership uh, behaviors. And I wonder, Jessica, as you've grown like across the different levels of leadership in the company towards the top now, how do you keep people like across all levels below you motivated? And I guess they are quite different now as you have more new entries and newer generations coming to work for you. So how do you keep people from different levels and different backgrounds motivated into like one team spirit? Yeah. It's a great question, and I think it's something that is, is very iterative. As the environment changes and the landscape changes, your approach also needs to evolve. So I don't think it's a, it's a one-size-fits-all and a one-time, kind of one formula thing. Um, so I'll share a few of the things that I try and do. Um, I try and be clear with the team around what's going on and therefore why some of the things that are happening, which might not seem perfect, are happening. So, for example... Um, when you start to come off your number, inevitably, there are a lot more ad hoc requests. So whenever I make ad hoc requests to my team, I try to explain why I'm making them. I try to give them a clear deadline. I try to be reason reasonable on it. And wherever possible, I try and show them how that input has been used um, so that then they can see that they're, something that might have been slightly irritating to them is actually part of a bigger picture. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing um, is around, it comes back to that healthy lifestyle piece um, it's around kind of really understanding people as individuals. I spoke a little bit about Strength Finder. My number one strength is individualization. Um, I, I don't have a cookie cutter approach to people. Um, and so really understanding what is that individual's um, thing that lights them up um, it is really important to me. Now, as you go up in an organization, you need to systemize that. And one of the ways that we have systemized that at GPN UK is through a, well, a wellness objective is what we call it. Um, but it's something that is kind of bonused in the team and it's something declared by the employee that is going to be something that if they complete that year, uh, they will unlock part of their bonus. Um, it can vary from um, volunteering at an animal uh, wildlife centre 40 week, 45 days a year. We have a 2pm finish on a Friday, so using that time in that way. Uh, cycling or running 1,000 kilometres in a year, picking your kids up from school, four times a week. Um, mine is around step count and sleep. So trying to, well, not trying, like I've committed, I will sleep over an average seven hours and walk over on average 12,000 steps a day. So those are, those are mine. And so that conversation drives a very different um, discussion between manager and employee. I'm not in every conversation, of course, but it is a conversation I expect every manager to have with their mm -hmm. employees. And I encourage uh, the team to kind of share more broadly um, and then I think as well, just trying to celebrate and recognize you are, where you are along the way um, and doing that in an authentic manner um, is also really important to keep people focused. Yeah, no, it's interesting the thing of like having like a lifestyle, a life goal embedded into work. No, I think it's probably a way if you can break that barrier of like maybe people don't want to open up or whatever, it's a great way to also make people more comfortable and do the thing of like bring your whole self to work part, which is probably easier said than done, no? Well, that's it. And I think it also um, decouples performance and presenteeism, because as soon as you make it a priority that you do the thing that works for you, whilst coupling it with performance, then suddenly you can genuinely have a flexible approach to work. Mm -hmm. And so if someone on the leadership team wellness objective is I'm going to drop my kids at school twice a week and pick them up twice a week, then suddenly they're turning up at 10 and they're leaving at 3.30 and no one's blinking an eye. That suddenly makes it really permissible for everyone else to do the same. Yeah. And that's not about then hours dropping, that's about being performance focused and output focused um, rather than you know everyone being present at all times. It's really important as you do that, that you couple it with feedback conversations so people know where they stand and they know where their performance is. Uh, we did a training session this year on coaching for performance and making sure that people are able, managers are able to have the appropriate conversations um, to help people improve their performance and continually evolve it because 
you know, what was good a year ago, you know, probably isn't where it needs to be this year with the business evolving and the team evolving. Um, so continuing to level people up um, is also really important. And if you look at yourself in the mirror, like now versus the person that you were before leading teams, like, do you, yeah. do you see any like type of like change that, that you've experimented due to that? Um, I think, I think the biggest thing is that I think when, um, when I was younger in my career, I thought that the leaders had all the answers. Mm. And what I realize now is that as a leader, you don't have the answers. You're not close to the detail. You're not kind of firing the bullets as it were. Um, but you do have experience to know what needs to be done and an ability to kind of judge different perspectives and help position contexts that people who are closer to the detail might have. So I think maybe I underestimated earlier in my career how, um, how I was actually the owner of the destiny. And, it, and when I, I was always quite surprised when I had ideas and, and you know, I did a bit of work around them and kind of presented them a bit like, oh God, I don't know whether they're going to think this is good. They were often, they were often very well received. And I was always like, oh, but surely they know all this stuff. You don't know. You only know what your team is feeding you. And I think um, that that's twofold. Like, you need to make sure that you're setting your team up to feed you the right things. But you also, uh, you know, when you're not in a position of leadership, it's almost then that it's more important to lead because that personal leadership on, you, on what you uniquely own is actually what makes a difference in a business. And something I really want to ask, Seska, is that uh, throughout your career, you started and evolved in the commercial function and yes. as a woman. So I'm very keen to uh, understand what kind of impact this has had on you and the way that you are also as a leader. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I think I've been very lucky um, to feel most of my life prior to P&G and, and from P&G on that I was kind of capable of doing anything, female or not. And there are certain choices that you make that might have been harder, but ultimately I was kind of confident that if you really want to do something, you could do it. I, I do believe that. Um, at least a huge personal pressure and accountability, but that's kind of a side topic. Like, I, I do believe that. And so the fact I was a, as a female didn't ever really bother me, um, and I just kind of got on with it. I, I have good relationships with guys. I'm quite accepting as well of the differences between men and women. I sort of see it as equal but different. And I haven't seen it as a barrier. Um, I think now, as we're sort of, you know, coming into a, a longer tenure in the career and you've got almost two decades of change behind, I think actually there's now an opportunity for leaders to, um, you know, really embrace their different styles and become even more authentic. And I think a, a leadership style has probably been, on a bell curve, it's probably been quite narrow. I do actually think it can spread out a little bit more now and gender can play a role there as well and actually embracing some of the differences between men and women and bringing that to life in your leadership style um, is actually something that I think could be ever more powerful. I wouldn't say I've necessarily cracked that or I'm doing that consistently today, but I wouldn't be, if, if there was something there, I think I would be quite bold with it because I do think there is a general recognition now that men and women can both lead. Sometimes they're different, just as different people are different, um, but actually leaning into some of the differences that are linked to being female um, is a strength rather than a, a debilitator. Absolutely. What about, so we've gone through your career at the beginning, we've gone through like the leadership lessons that you've learned. If you had to go back to your younger self, that, that summer that you spent, that lucky summer where you were done with your studies and knew you had a, a good job ready for you, if you, had to, if you went back in time and you could give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Um... Uh I think it would be just really embrace the phase. I think, um, and don't worry too much about what will come. Um, and if I, if I give an example, like, you know, when you're a graduate, there are just things that you can do as a graduate that I can't do now. And those are really, really fun. Um, and I would just like fully embrace that. I also think, um, I used to be like, gosh, I'm never going to make it all work. Like, if I have a child, how am I going to work and exercise? It's just not possible. And actually, that's not true. It is possible. Your priorities just change. 
um, you know, when I was in my late mid to late twenties, I was going out for dinner a lot with my friends. Like I don't do that anymore. That has unlocked like a lot more time in my week, which I can now reallocate to exercise or, or my child or a little bit more work in the evenings because I left earlier versus working till 6.30 or six or whatever, and then trying to make it work. So I think it would just be about embrace the phase. Don't worry that it's not going to be possible because if, again, coming back to that philosophy of anything is possible if you want it, you'll find a way to make it work. And because I'm both performance and lifestyle focused, like if my, I won't feel I'm performing if my life isn't in order. And so I think, um, yeah, that, that embrace, embrace the phase and just see there's good and bad in everything, but really embrace the good because everything will change and then it will be different and you won't have the bad, but you might not have some of the good as well. That would be probably, and that, that comes to like levels of ambition and desperate to get the next role. I've had so many conversations with um, people like, I just want people management. And I'm like, I know you will get people management. And when you get it, you will miss when you didn't have it so much because people are unpredictable they like they're brilliant and it's wonderful and of course i would encourage everyone to have people management but not having people management is also brilliant so like just embrace the phase and trust that it will come um would probably be the advice uh, i would give This was Jessica Watson, UK General Manager at Glambia Performance Nutrition. Christina, how was the chat? What did you learn from your PNG alumni? It was a very interesting chat. Uh, apart from Jessica having like a very uh, unique journey from one side of the world to another. Yeah. Uh, I loved how to summarize all the things about uh, the power of formulas and frameworks that PNG has and how it helps structure your thinking and your ideas, but without constraining you. Uh, this uh, I resonate a lot with. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that it just goes to show, I think that the people that leave PNG and have the agility, they're really able to like bring the, that best practice, that funding of best practice into another environment and they do very well, no? Like you. <laughs> well, I'm trying, uh, but for sure it's a big school. But the fact that Jessica had the uh, opportunity to also move to different countries, you saw like even in um, some countries where you would expect them to be a lot more similar, like for example, the UK and Australia. I mean, Australia is not India, right? You still see that there are a lot of differences in the way that you are managing a business and there's still so much to learn when you go within the retail and uh, FMCG sectors. So I think uh, the learnings that you said there are also quite powerful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and as we know, and as we've said, at PNG normally it's very structured. So you, if you move countries, you go to Geneva, if you're in Europe, so going to Australia is an interesting one. And, and it just comes to show that like taking these like unusual turns can add a lot of value. Um, what about like the, the category of performance nutrition? I thought it was very interesting. It is a very interesting one. Uh, you see that overall the whole functioning, functional beverages and food uh, and ingredients across different categories. I have seen a rise in uh, the past years. I'm very keen to see how this behavior is going to evolve, but definitely there is a lot of growth still to be unlocked. As you mentioned, even though we have a lot of buzz around them because also, you know, they over-index, I guess, in social media because also of the younger generations uh, being more keen to try these things, the opportunity to increase the penetration is still huge and vast. And uh, we do know that with regards to the long-term strategies of companies, well-being and the overall concept of wellness is something that is very high on everybody's agenda. And that's a uh, part where these um, uh, kind of categories play very strong as well. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting to see how she linked the whole mission of the company to her way of leading and the whole overall company culture. I don't believe you need to do that in a company for it for the culture to work. But if you mm -hmm. can do it, it creates like a really nice buzz, like a Nike type of like yes. on the offense type of buzz that's really cool if it if it works well. 
Absolutely, because they had both kind of like the performance as well as the healthy part, which yeah. caters both to like the business and the people in a very nice and balanced way. So it feels like a really good uh, fit what they have done. And I, I sincerely hope that it, it's actually working like this. Uh, and if it does, then it should be creating like a very impressive culture. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, one thing that I, that's the last one from my side, I loved what you said about that about the leaders having all the answers and that leaders don't have all the answers because you're not in the detail, right? So I thought that that was a really nice way to summarize it, why leaders don't have all the answers. And, and they should uh... Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with you. I love that part. And I love also what you said that you only know what your team is feeding you, which is speaks tones, not only about the capabilities of the teams and the freedom they need to have in order to be exploring more so they can bring back more, but yeah. also when it comes to the culture of trust and them feeling that they are in a safe space so that they can bring new ideas the way that Jessica did to her leaders back in the day. You want your team to be doing this for yeah. you right now. Absolutely. Cool. Well, this was super interesting. Christina, thanks for joining me this time virtually. Look forward to seeing you soon in person. I don't know what's coming up. Maybe a couple of things after after summer. Uh, and thanks to our audience as well for tuning in. If you enjoyed this show, please leave us a, an Apple podcast review. You can leave, leave us five stars. That's fine. But it will really help us um, feed the algorithm and have more visibility in this network. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you in the next episode of the FMCG, guys. Have a great day.